There we go. Good morning. Good morning, Daily Huddlers, the day before the day of gratitude. I have a question. <laughs> All right, Giovanni, why did the cows return to the marijuana field? Why did the cows return to the marijuana field? Yes. It would be too obvious to say to get high, but I don't know. What <laughs> <is> it? <laughs> it, it was the pot calling the cattle back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs>
Then she shared with me that her dad, who had been living with her, passed away. Then she said that her very best friend since high school had been diagnosed with cancer. And then she said, oh, by the way, my husband had a stroke, so I'm caring for him as well. And she went through this list of things that she'd been dealing with. And she said, so it hasn't been such an easy time for me. She said, but I practice gratitude. And I always remember that no matter what I'm facing, that there's somebody out there that's facing something more difficult than I am. And there's danger in that mentality. And that's what I want to talk about today. What she did was something called comparative suffering, where we rank our pain and we try to diminish it. And we don't allow ourselves to feel our pain because it doesn't stack up to somebody else's. For years, many of you know that um, there's been some suffering in my family that was really sparked by the illness of my 12-year-old daughter. And for years, people would share, you know, good friends would say, you know, I'm worried about, you know, the struggle with my daughter. She's not doing well in school or something that they were worried about. And then they'd say, oh, but that has nothing compared to what you're facing, as if their pain didn't matter. And I have learned firsthand how this truly, truly can be damaging. And before I dig into my experience of it, um, I want to set the stage. So I am writing a memoir. And I want to read a little excerpt from it. So this is in a chapter called Colt 45 and Two Zigzags, which you won't get to know why the chapter is called that um, until you get the book, which should be out hopefully in a little over a year. But I want to share something from the book. So a little context. It was 2005 and three healthy children didn't realize how grateful, how, how much gratitude I should have had for that. When my 12, so I had a husband named Billy, who is now my ex-husband, but still my very good friend, a son named Wilson, who was 14, a daughter who was 12, and a daughter, Holly, who was nine and in the fourth grade. And Caroline, our middle daughter, got very sick and was rushed to um, the hospital and was in a coma for several days. When she came out of the coma, she didn't recognize anybody. She was in this awful fear state. She was screaming, she was having seizures and they would sedate her. She would wake up and she was screaming, where's my mom, where am I? She was in terror and then they would sedate her. And this went on for five days. And so that's where we are when I wanna read this little excerpt to you all um, from my book. And interestingly, it doesn't exactly have much to do with Caroline but it really will set the stage for what we're talking about. So let me see if I can pull this up and read it to you. Let's see here. Let me see, exit full screen so I can get to it. Okay, so here we are. About the fifth day in the ICU, Caroline woke up again and she recognized me. She knew her dad. She smiled. She smiled that sweet, mischievous smile. Then she tried to grab the feeding tube, but her wrists were loosely strapped to the bed rails. I ripped off one of the straps held her dry hand and searched her eyes. Mom, she whispered, am I in the hospital? I could hear Billy. He has this way of trying to hold back tears that sound like a choke and a chuckle. I've seen this man smile through tears all my life. The sound hit my heart and reminded me I am never alone. Billy, the one who wanted all these kids so quickly, the person I had counted on in life above all others, he was doing that thing where he sort of chuckles back, happy tears. I will love him forever. Caroline was stabilizing and the seizures were slowing. The scrub team, as I affectionately called them, moved her into a regular room where she would start intensive therapy, where she could have visitors and where I could have emotional outbursts that would not be recorded and reviewed. Exhaustion like I had never known was quickly approaching. It seemed like the right time to race home, reload my overnight bag, and see Holly. Wilson was coming to the hospital to visit soon because he had begged to come every single day since we arrived. But we felt Holly was too young to visit at this point. So I drove the 60-some miles to the Atlanta Children's Hospital directly to Watkinsville and straight into the elementary school parking lot. Holly was in the fourth grade. As I speed walked up the corridor to the entrance, I thought back to our last parent-teacher conference. 
Miss Spalding, Holly's teacher, had told us. Holly is whip smart. Also, she is highly sensitive and intuitive. Her motivation and her propensity to worry are both off the charts. Holly will be one of those. Holly will be one of two things. She will be amazing or she will be a mess. There is no middle ground for Holly. Oh, she is and will be amazing, I muttered to myself as I approached all the smiling women in the front office. They gushed and hugged and told me about all the churches with Caroline on their prayer list. They wanted information, but I objected. I just need to check out Holly for the day, please. I signed the clipboard's ledger and raced down the hallway to Miss Spalding's room. I opened the door and looked over at Holly. She was all in, fully devoted to her worksheet, intensity wrapped around her pencil, sitting on her foot folded under her, quickly filling in answers. Miss Spalding looked over at me and softly called out, Holly. Holly popped her head up, saw me, threw her chair back and ran to me, mommy. No one can hug like Holly. It's a giving hug, fully present, no hesitation, no caution, no partial commitment. Almost from birth, Holly seemed to hug life with all her might. That full-blown smile, that embracing energy, that inquisitive mind. Anyone who's a parent can probably relate to what I'm about to say. My love for her feels like sweetness and heat, like fire, hot cocoa and fire. I remember again what Miss Spalding said. There is no middle ground for Holly. Thank God, I say to myself as I held my baby and drank in her bubbling spirit. So that was many, many years ago. And the reason why I share that story is because soon after that hug from Holly, I didn't feel that hug from her for probably over 10 years. Her hugs changed, her spirit changed, and I'm going to tell you why. Because as Caroline was suffering and her health was failing and her mom was running all over the country, literally looking for answers for seizures and her brother was having issues and there was trauma in the home, Holly was hurting. And do you know what I did to Holly? When she would come to me and tell me how sad she was or how hard things were or how it wasn't fair. She used to be the little sister. Now she felt like the big sister. She was having to help manage seizures, how unfair it was. Do you know what mom said to her? People have it so much worse than you, Holly. There are people who have lost their lives and lost their parents, people who are hungry, people who are struggling. In that moment, I think I thought I was doing the right thing but that affected her for a very long time. I can tell you today that Holly has that spirit and that hug back, but it took years and years for her to come back to who she was because I diminished her feelings. And I share this because I also have done my research on gratitude and how gratitude actually can really help us with comparative suffering. And I didn't make that space. I did not make that space for Holly. I just kept telling her to buck up. Here's what I've learned from one of my favorite people, as you all know, Brene Brown. She explains to us that when we compare our suffering to others, we are stuffing it down and we're denying our emotions. And if we don't give empathy to ourselves and to other people, those emotions multiply. They affect us so negatively. So think about this. If you know somebody who seems to always be complaining and always looking at what they don't have, we've got to have compassion for that because I bet you I would be willing to bet that their feelings were diminished as a child just as I did to my own child all those years ago. So what do we do with this information? How do we stop comparing our suffering? We, we tend to want to rank our suffering, just like my friend did on the phone. There's some truth to that. But I want us to think about taking better care of ourselves and not walking away from gratitude, but building up gratitude and at the same time, allowing our feelings in. So I've got four tips, four talk to the brain tips about how we can better take care of ourselves, allow our suffering without it crumbling us 
and still remaining potentially more grateful than ever before. And so I've got these tips for you. And one is to find perspectives. And number one is find perspective. Think about this. Your marriage could be in a bumpy place, but you feel like you can't talk to your friend about it because she lost her husband. Oh, how I could never complain about the struggle that I'm having with my marriage because my friend actually lost her husband. The two things do not have to be separate. They don't have to be one or the other. We can be in pain and we can hurt and we can acknowledge our suffering and have empathy and self-compassion and still feel hurt for somebody else. But there's a mechanism in our brain that tells us that empathy has a reservoir and we can run out of it. And what I've learned is that that absolutely is not true. Number two, and this is a big one, and this is one of the themes in my book actually, is to unpack our feelings and let them flow through us. We try to protect ourselves by fighting off our feelings. And now I know when I look back why I couldn't just hold Holly and let her cry into her mom's shoulder, which is all she needed. Why did I have to try to talk her out of that hurt? I was protecting myself. I was afraid that if I let those emotions in, that I might not rise again. But all the research I've done and the study and the work lets us know that we will rise again stronger and better than before. So we absolutely need to let those feelings in, justify them, no matter how small they are. If you feel big pain for what seems small in comparison to others, that means you have a heart. That means we're human. That means we have the capacity to care. And to deny ourselves those feelings is going to diminish our ability to care and to feel. And that depletes relationships and that depletes the way we experience life. Let your tears fall. The third thing is make space for empathy. I want to think about this for a minute because empathy, and we're going to do a whole talk on this, empathy and compassion are two different things. Empathy is more absorbing the feelings of someone else. We have to make space for the empathy of ourselves. As I said before, you may think, well, I know people who, who they don't do, they don't practice comparative suffering. They feel sorry for themselves all the time. Holly felt sorry for herself for a long, long time. And rightfully so, because she was never, ever giving the empath given the empathy that she so rightly needed and deserved. She had a brother that started to truly suffer to where it caused trauma in her house. She had a sister that was causing constant upheaval. And so she thought in her head, well, I am going to have to suffer like that in order to matter in this family. Those scars are still there. While she's worked through so much of this, the scars remain. That's how we're made. We have to accept and allow our feelings. And then the last one and the big one, which is so timely today, is the practice of gratitude. And I want to circle back to that. We don't have to choose one or the other. We don't have to choose, well, I'm suffering, so I can't be grateful. I'm grateful, so therefore I should not be suffering. We have both. Every morning when we wake up, there is something to celebrate. And there is something to cry about. And many of you have heard me say this before. Do both. Let those tears flow. And then stand up out of our beds and decide where we're going to put our focus today. And this is one of the things that has allowed joy into my life and good experiences through some of the very, very worst times. And it is focus. Because you know what? All of these emotions that we are talking about, they're forms of energy. And we have the power to take charge of our energy. Let your pain in, allow it, and then be very devoted to the practice of gratitude. So that when we get up and we face the day, we can focus on what we're grateful for, but not diminish the fact that we're all suffering. So those are the four tips. And gratitude is the number one way to stop the comparative suffering, to let that pain in. As I always say, pain is undefeated. 
If we don't let it in, we cannot let it out. So those are my four talk to the brain tips for today. Can we OD on gratitude? I say no, but let's be very intentional about how we use it. Find perspective. Realize that we can have pain and we can have gratitude. Unpack our feelings, number two, have compassion. Number three, make space for empathy. And lastly, practice your gratitude. Be very intentional about it, whether it's journaling, whether it's expressing, whether it's meditation, practice your gratitude. Thank you all for being in this conversation this morning. I see I have some comments or questions from Rashida. So we'll start with you, Rashida, and then Cece. Good morning. Good morning, family daily hood. Thank you so much, Tara. You have me tearing, tearing. And why I say tearing is because in such an important point. And why I say that is because in a couple months, I would not say in a couple months ago, four months ago, uh, my boyfriend was in coma for mm. a month. And trust me, I can I can be testi testimony have been there with the hustle and bustle going to work, come back, go to go to the hospital, visit, clean him up, go back to the. It was one of those things, but you know, the most strongest thing that put me and see me through the 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 what do we say the journey was being grateful for every single thing. The doctor then was coming and said, oh, what are you going to do? I said, I don't have anything to do more and pray and be grateful. He said, grateful for what? Death thing was <laughs> death thing and that. The doctor them and the nurses them said, how can you be grateful? I said, this is what make me stronger. It what make me go and what make, make me come. My my practice of gratitude been for so many years, but that month I'd seen my loved one in bed for all month, the gratitude grows stronger and mm -hmm. bigger. It was giant. <laughs> and trust me, being a giant gratitude make me know that nothing's matter more I live by gratitude. Thank you so much for really emphasizing that point well taken and I practice oh. it by the minute. Thank you so much, Tara. Oh, thank you for your spirit, Rashida. Good morning, Cece. Good morning. Thank you so much for the topic because um, I can identify with that. Um, I used to put everything underneath the rug, you know, like, how you doing? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And really, I wasn't. So, Today, I am dealing, I'm actually embracing um, feelings, you know, Ooh. legitimate feelings. You got made up feelings. <laughs> and, and, you know, for years, I was driving back and forth to Texas, San Antonio, Texas, from Atlanta to see about my parents. And that's now around the corner. <laughs> And I would jump up driving. My mother would be in the hospital. She would get out the next day as soon as I got there. And it was just a rat race. I didn't know how to be with feelings. I was just, uh, what do you call it, a pretender. So now mm -hmm. I'm not pretending like everything is all right. And I am grateful that I am not worse off than what I have. I am thankful that I have my right mind, thanks to God. I am thankful for these feelings. These feelings are here for a reason to process them, not stuff them underneath the rug. Oh, I'm fine. No. <laughs> yeah. I, thank you for saying that. That's a, that's another one of the themes toward the end of my book. Actually, I I my son always said, "I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine." He wasn't fine. He wasn't fine. But I just let it be. So bless you, sweetheart. Ronald, what you doing? You're taking your clothes off for us. <laughs> We're shifting the conversation. <laughs> yeah, kind of getting hot in the air. Um, this is great, <laughs> great talk today. It's absolutely great talk. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess my question to you is more of, um, I know I know through experience and through so many writing, you 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 really come down to this. Um, it's very apropos for the time we are, for, for the week that we're in. But one thing I want to ask you, what is your best 
space to write. I mean, how do you set yourself to write? And also, and I'm re I was really in tune with your writing, with 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 the story. Uh, and I and I found at time you really explain what's going on in the space in the room, and I felt there. I was like in the room with you, but at time you also let your opinion or your your feeling or, or your impression of this of of the situation come through your writing. So yeah. talk about that, like like your space to write, where and when, uh, how do you write? And then when in your writing, you let that uh, emotion or piece of information come through. Um, thank you for this question. And I'm not an expert, but I can tell you that I've studied the question that you posed so much as it relates to myself personally. And I, I, when I decided to write this book, I promised myself that it would be absolutely honest, that I wouldn't pretend in any way to be this mom that's like, yes, I'm so strong. I've got this figured out. I'm so grateful. Everything's okay. I had some pretty dark thoughts through, through the years. And don't we all? And I was determined to share those, number one. Um, but I also, and this was through, through a book coach, she said, make sure that your writing is a gift. And so I try to let it be also moments through the years, I would find these moments of learning how to still have joy in the face of all this suffering. So that's one thing about the writing, but, but how do I find the space and the time? And I'm grateful that you even would think that it takes something more than just time because it doesn't. Like a friend of mine recently said, oh, why don't you take a little time to work on your book today? I got to be in the perfect headspace. I have to be in my creative space. I can't have distractions or cannot be distracted. So I have to figure out what time of day is best for me. For me, it's mornings. Like when the world is not up yet, I can be really creative. Or um, I told a friend, and I know we're up on time, but I told a friend recently, um, we were supposed to have dinner together and he canceled. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take myself out. And I went into a bar. <laughs> with my computer, ordered a martini and some olives and bread. And I sat there and worked on my book. It was magical. So <laughs> that worked for me too. Thank okay. you for that question. Yeah. All right, good deal. Oh, but we should talk about it more offline because I need some help in this arena too. Um, yeah, that's, that's tough. And you, you say you have a book. A book is, the you mentioned the name of a book there. Um, it's not finished yet and i'm i'm no, not no. even still i'm still not sold on the on the um, no, a book that you you read that say right from your heart is that correct is i don't think is that what you heard i think I you mentioned think a book that you read before that's that's the name of the book is right from your heart or no you okay. must have misunderstood me <laughs> yeah, I probably did yeah no I don't great think. great thank you um, for i'm sorry my question thank you Yes, absolutely. I think it, we got to close now, but um, I, it's really important to me that folks walk away from this time together with something that feels a little bit valuable. And so I just want to remind us all to really be intentional about that gratitude practice, but take care of yourselves. Don't diminish your feelings and your suffering. They're real. And the only way to get through them is to let them in. So I'm grateful for each and every one of you. And I'm going to end today with our eight tenets. And I'll start with love. Love, love with all your heart, fearlessly. We, we don't have a limited quantity of love. Give, give of your spirit, of your time, of your talents. And move your body. Be physical. Take care of the body. You only have one to live in. Sleep. Get your sleep, which also heals your body. Eat mostly plants. Your body will thank you. It will help you to stress less. And a big one that I love is to laugh out loud. Throw your head back. Let your laughter and your endorphins flow. And finally, from Dr. Monica Agondo, check your assumptions. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful holiday and many, many thanks to each and every one of you. Have a great holiday. Wow, everybody. have a beautiful one, Matt. Thank you so much. Beautiful you one, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Gio. Good to see you, Gio. Happy Thanksgiving, Miss Tara. Thank you, everybody.